I want to share with you a story that this is the perfect antithesis to the story that I want to share with you because this summer, I think I was the only clergy person who attended the Ozzy Osbourne Black Sabbath concert <laughs> in Austin, Texas. And I have to tell you that it can be a little confusing for a minister to know what to do when everyone around you is, has their hands up in the air and they're singing, God is dead. Think about that. Actually, I'm exaggerating because not everybody had their hands up in the air because some people had their hands down low. They were passing joints and just, I mean, doing all kinds of things. It was quite a scene. And here I was. Now, I, I did see a few other people that I think were clergy persons, but they were outside the concert protesting <laughs> what they consider to be more of a satanic cult ritual than a rock concert. So I'll tell you more about that experience a little bit later, but first let me explain how I ended up in about the 25th row on the floor at this heavy metal concert this summer. Some of you know this, my brother used to be a punk rock enthusiast during the 1980s, and he used to drag me to all these concerts when I was in high school and taught me how to slam dance and stage dive and, you know, taught me all about mosh pits. And you have to look out, because one of these days I have this fantasy of jumping off this <laughs> pulpit, doing a little crowd surfing across the sanctuary. That's on my bucket list. <laughs> Maybe homecoming Sunday, a couple of weeks. <laughs> So for the past 20 years, my brother has lived in Guatemala. I don't get to see him that often. And so when he called me up about a year ago and he said, hey, I've heard that Ozzy Osbourne might be reuniting with Black Sabbath after like 30 years. And, and if that happens, I'm going to fly back to the States and I want to see the concert and I want you to go with me. So I thought, well, this is obviously on his bucket list. <laughs> A bucket list being those things that one hopes to accomplish before they die. In fact, this was the second bucket list trip that I went on with someone this year. A buddy of mine always wanted to fly fish the Black Canyon of the Gunnison River in Colorado during the salmon fly hatch. And when this opportunity presented itself this spring, he invited me to join him. Now, salmon flies are about the size of crickets. And when they hatch once a year... Big trout, big trout come up to the surface to eat them. And needless to say, we were catching 22 and 24 inch trout in a place that was equally as remote and peaceful as the Black Sabbath concert was crowded and loud. All right, so tagging along on these two very different bucket list trips made me think about what might be on my own bucket list, things that I hoping to accomplish before I kick the bucket. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, Mother White. After seeing Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne, what more could one possibly have to accomplish <laughs> in this life? Well, there's still a couple things. There still are. But what about you? Have you spent much time thinking about what you want to accomplish before you leave this earth? Suppose you only have six months or a year left to live, what regrets would you have if they weren't done before you die? The question of what's on your bucket list is really a question of, do you have any unfinished business? If you find out tomorrow that you only have a short time left to live, would, you, would this cause you to change what you're doing? Now, of course, this question is not very abstract to some of us. Some of us have had the experience of going to see a doctor and receiving news that turned out to be life-changing. There's a mass in your lungs. We think we see a tumor in your x-rays. Your back will require surgery. I'm afraid you'll need to begin dialysis. 
These kinds of diagnoses make one think about how much time we have left, or at least what will be our quality of life as time goes on. How many days do I have left before my options become limited? And what do I want to do with this precious life while I still have time? Most of us live in what could be called the, the someday syndrome. It's those sentences we say that begin with, one of these days I've got to, or as soon as things quiet down, I really want to, or as soon as the kids grow up, or as soon as I retire. Steve Jobs gave a speech some years ago in which he said, when I was 17, I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day as if it were your last, someday you will most certainly be right. (laughs) He goes on, it made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Death is very clarifying. In the face of death, many petty concerns and fears and anxieties, they just disappear. We are all naked before death. When I was in India studying with some Tibetan, in a Tibetan Buddhist monastery back in the 90s, one of the meditations that we used to do each morning was to visualize our death. We sat there for a long time in silence, visualizing various ways that we could imagine that we might die when the end comes. It's an intense reminder that we will die someday, and it is certainly something that helped me appreciate what I have right now. I spent four years of my life living in in Asia and traveling through Asia in my 20s. I studied Buddhism pretty intensely in Japan and Korea and India and Tibet and Thailand. So when I returned to the United States and I went to seminary, and and of course part of the curriculum is studying the Bible and learning about the Bible, I started to read it with a perspective that was deeply influenced by Buddhist sensibilities. And in fact, the Bible finally started making sense to me once I started to look at it through Eastern philosophical thinking as well. I bring this up because Jesus had a bucket list, and this bucket list makes a lot of sense to me as I look at it through what I would consider a Buddhist lens. Now, in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, beginning at verse 21, Jesus tells the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and eventually be killed. Now, this is not his bucket list. (laughs) But this is the introduction to his bucket list. We can assume that everything he says after that, he's saying with a full awareness that he'll be dead soon. With this announcement that his days were limited, Jesus begins to teach and share all the things he wanted to make sure to say before he left his earthly life behind. He begins to tell them that being disciples will not be easy, that there will be stumbling blocks, some that come externally and some that will come from inside, like doubts and fears. Through his parables, he teaches about forgiveness and compassion and being service-oriented. It was a bucket list in the sense that he was giving them all the things that are necessary to live a meaningful life so that when They come to the end of their lives. When we come to the end of our lives, we'll have no regrets that we somehow did it wrong, that we missed the essence and beauty and meaning of it all. He wanted his disciples to have a list, so to speak, so that the work that he started could continue long after he was gone. Now, at one point when Jesus is asked about an abbreviated list, he narrows it down to two. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, one of the scribes asks Jesus an all-important question. What commandment is foremost of all? In verse 29, Jesus answers, saying, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment, he says, greater than these. He says that if you're really trying to pare it down, you only need to do two things to die having accomplished life's ultimate goal. Love God and love your neighbor. And as you read on, you see that most of the ways that Jesus tells us to love God is by loving our neighbors. So in fact, there's really only one thing we need to do, and that's love. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have some fun, quirky, and idiosyncratic things on our bucket lists. For example, I'd like to ride a hot air balloon someday. And I would love to visit Alaska and maybe write a book. But if I were to die without having done any of those things, my life would still be complete. But if I were to leave this life having not learned how to love and be loved, I would die having never fully lived. Every day, I inch a little bit closer to being able to fully love myself with all my foibles and shortcomings. Every week, I get Better at loving my wife, who mercifully loves me despite all of my foibles and shortcomings. Or despite most of them, as she likes to remind me. I'm convinced that we are in this life to learn how to love and be loved. And I don't just mean this in a romantic sense, of course. Which brings me right back to the Black Sabbath concert. (laughs) Imagine... 15,000 people from ages 16 to 75 with their fists in the air singing along with a song that repeats the lyrics, God is dead, over and over. The decibel level is cranked up and the drums and the bass are thumping. The electric guitar is screeching out ecstatic jams and Ozzy Osbourne's haunting voice is bellowing this postmodern anthem. And I was probably the only one in the midst of all of this excitement who was trying to concentrate on the lyrics to discern some theological content. (laughs) And to my surprise, here's what I discovered. I'm going to share with you some of the lyrics. It said, the voices echo in my head, is God alive or is God dead? Now, so far, this is a fair question. Many people are asking this question and have over the centuries. The song goes on. Rivers of evil run through the land, killing and stealing. Who do you trust when there's so much corruption and lust and injustice that leaves you empty and unwhole? Will someone tell me the answer, is God really dead? Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, wondering if we will meet again on the other side. Do you believe a word what the good book said? Or is it just a holy fairy tale and God is dead? The voices in my head are telling me that God is dead. And then the song ends with this line, which is repeated twice in the final two verses. I don't believe that God is dead. In the end, the musicians are saying that despite all the reasons to question the existence of God, the corruption, the hypocrisy, the injustice, they believe in God. So what did I make of this? First of all, this song is from their new album, which reached number one on the Billboard charts in the United States this summer, which means that Black Sabbath are reaching millions of people of all ages, which would be millions more than I'm reaching from this pulpit. (laughs) Let's just put that out there. (laughs) I'm just saying, and I will bet that a lot of them are not your average church-going folks. This song is a commentary on the way that many people today question the existence of God. Best-selling authors are doing it, academics are doing it, The Christians who are leaving the churches in droves are doing it. And so these bad boy rockers, or really 
bad men, Rock. They're kind of old. <laughs> We're all getting kind of old. Give us many reasons why we might question God's existence, but in the end, they come down on the side that there is a God. What kind of God? Well, it may not be the traditional definition of God that many people grow up with and that gets taught in many houses of worship. The way that it seems to many people, when they look at what's being taught in there, they see, I've heard people say all of these things. The Jewish God is often jealous, controlling, and vindictive, always ordering the Israelites around and giving them a list of punishments for when they disobey. The Muslim God in the Quran, it says many redeeming and inspiring things, but also orders his followers to kill infidels. The Christian God, like Zeus, has a child with a human being. The Christian God, who many say will send people to burn for eternity and torture. At least that's what is taught. From Scripture, and I realize that these are literal translations, but that's not how many, and, and literal translations is how many people read the Scriptures and teach the Scriptures. And I'll just say that none of these gods, as described, and none of these Scriptures, when taken literally, hold much interest for me. And they're holding less and less interest for more and more people. So this is where the Buddhist training and practices have helped me to understand the idea of ultimate reality or God in a more realistic and, for me, a more powerful way. And over the past 25 years, my regular spiritual practice has been, off and on, has been meditation. Keep in mind that Moses meditated for 40 days on the mountain before receiving the commandments. Jesus meditated, and of course, Buddha found enlightenment through meditation. The point is that all religions started with pure experience and only later were written down into manuals. Today, most people who call themselves religious follow the manuals, literally, and have lost sight of the realm of direct experience. The goal of meditation is to quiet the mind and listen to the heart. To try to find in our heartbeat the heartbeat of all existence. To try to stop our mind's constant march of daydreaming about the past and worrying and fantasizing about the future so that we can truly be present and alive in the moment, experiencing the heart of existence. What is the heart of existence? Love. As the Bible says, love is God, God is love. In 1 John 4, verse 8, it says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And a few verses later in 1 John 4, verse 16, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. When we quiet the mind, we experience the love which dwells in our heart. Think about it. Our minds are filled with expectations and longings and cultural constructions, ideas that others have put their parents and teachers and preachers and society. But when we come to that place of just being, without the mind filtering and controlling the experience, we can feel the heartbeat of existence. Unfiltered, unmediated. What is it? It's love, absolute, unconditional love. The goal of our lives is to know and experience and share love. What is love? It's unity and harmony and connection. What gets in our way of experiencing love? It's when we're, we allow our desires and our minds to create dissatisfaction. In other words, we often have trouble accepting what is, what is real, because we tend to become driven by our wants for something else. These desires and expectations create unhappiness with what we have right now. 
The problem with our desires, according to the Buddha, is that they are insatiable. When we get the object of our desire, we soon want something else. Right? One teacher, uh, one of my teachers of organizational development, his name's Itzhak Adizis, who is a wise soul, he himself has started meditating late in his life. And he has said, if we wish for one million dollars, and then we get it, soon we want two million dollars. And then once we have two million dollars, we start thinking five million dollars seems like a good goal, and we start wanting more. Our desires are always changing, and that's why they cause us so much distress. When we focus on what we think is absent in ourselves or in our lives, it keeps us from experiencing what is. And it is through experiencing what is that we come to know love, which is God. It involves surrendering to what is and opening ourselves to something beyond our own will. Now, how do we surrender without giving ourselves over to something that might be in itself demonic, like so many religions have become? Many people have given themselves over to some religious philosophy or teaching or teacher only to find that they've been burned. And have come to say, never again. I'm going to think for myself. I am never going to give over my agency or my will to anything or anyone else. Of course. Of course. But is there a way to surrender to something larger that does not involve putting ourselves in jeopardy of manipulation by others? Yes. We can quiet the mind and let go of our desires and fears for long enough to allow life in its purest form to be felt within our hearts. This is how we can experience the love that dwells within. And if we believe that love is God, then it is how we can come to know the presence of God or ultimate reality. And once we experience it within, then we begin to experience it all around us in other people and in the trees and the oceans and the animals too. That's not enough, of course. It's not enough to just experience love. We need to express love. We're here to express the love that's inside us. And our need to express this love that's within, it calls us to creativity and to compassion as ways of manifesting the love that we feel and that we see all around us. We begin to see love in the faces of children who we're teaching to read. We start to see love in the eyes of those who are surviving tragedy and war. We begin to see it in the trees and the birds and the wetlands churning back to life after an oil spill. Next week in my message, I'm going to go to the next step of how we know when we're expressing love. When we're expressing, if you will, the, the will of God as we understand it from our own direct experience. Because there are many people who do great harm in the name of loving God or following what they believe is God's will. And if we're going to be on a path like this, we need to have, it's important to have a gauge as to when we're on a positive and healthy track and when we're not. So that's next Sunday. But for today, I want to end with the idea that no bucket list is complete if it doesn't have on it the goal of learning to love and be loved. No life is complete if it is not, in the end, an expression of the love within. So I'll leave you with one of my favorite poems. It's called The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean the one who has flung herself onto the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, 
Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes? Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention and how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Amen.